light suitcase if you go to the south. I started heading to Panama, from Panama to Peru and to Machu Picchu. Anybody been to Machu Picchu? Yes. It is the land of the Incas where there's llamas. Uh, unlike Shirley MacLaine, I did not have an out-of-body experience there. And I arrived in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. This is right after Mardi Gras. The samba is still in the air. And for reasons that are too complex to, to go into, I had to get certification that I was Jewish. So I asked one of the people that I had connections to to find me a rabbi. Now, this guy seemed like a very safe bet because not only was he a very prominent citizen, he had his own island and his own plane, but he was dating the illegitimate daughter of the Cardinal of Rio. So I figured anybody who gives me a rabbi who's that is safe, right? You don't have to worry. So I never check the rabbi out, right? So I make an appointment, and they invite me on Friday evening. Like a good girl, I bring flowers, and I knock on the door. The door opens this man with the this and the that, and she's got the thing on her head. I said, oh my God, it's the black ones. <laughs> I said, I got, oh my God, how do I get out of here, huh? She says to me, Shabbat Shalom. I said, Shabbat Shalom. He blacked it you lit candles? I said, no. You see, for me, this was the best fiddler on the roof, really was voodoo. Can you believe that I was raised in Israel and lighting candles was not part of, part of my life, not of my family's? Mm -hmm. That people in America sometimes can't comprehend the difference between being an Israeli, a proud Israeli, but not understanding that there's a connection between Israeli and Jewish. So to me, this was like a bunch of retarded people making voodoo, and then they mumble, blah, 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 and they look like Rabbi Schmerling, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Shmueling, I made a lot of, a lot of me a culpa since then. <laughs> anyway, so, so here I am, and I say, in Rome you do as the one who me. And I do my, yeah, of course I, I'd heard of the prayer. And before I had time to analyze the mixture of awe and disgust, compromising my principles and awe of this phenomenal new action that I was doing, in walks this elegant looking creature. And she is wearing the Gucci and the Pucci and the Bali and the Mali. Today would be Prada, Escada, and whatever is in. And they say, this is our daughter. I said, but she looks normal. <laughs> I said to her, what are you doing with them? <laughs> she said, I'm getting my trousseau ready. I'm getting married to a Hasid in the Lubavitcher Rebbe's court. And I'm seeing knights and armors and moats. <laughs> <laughs> so she says to me, do you want to see a picture of my fiance? I said, of course. So she puts me a picture. I look at it and I say, how can you tell them apart? They all look the same. <laughs> I said, I'm going to help you run away. I'm going to get you out of here. You're going to be pregnant for the rest of your life. You're going to be cooking chicken soup forever. I said, this is for them, but you? I said, look, I don't mean disrespect to your parents, but let's face it, you're intelligent. You speak so many languages. You. Come with me. Well, guess who came with who, but that's another story. <laughs> so I'm starting with this girl. I said to her, come on, you really believe all that stuff? You really believe that a woman is a second-class citizen? They pray behind the curtain. You, you're hidden. They get all these aliyahs, and, and, and they wrap themselves and do all the action. Is in there, and you, you're cooking? And she's answering with style, with class, with intelligence, and I'm falling in love with her. I'm 10 years her senior, been and done 100 more things, and she's just a young girl, and I can get over her. I know she has something that I don't have. It's what Ilana was talking about, Marx. I mean, I was feeling this thing, but I couldn't put my finger on it. So I said, listen, can I see you again, please? She says, sure, would you like to come to shul with me tomorrow? <laughs> I said, shul, mosque, ashram, church. I don't discriminate, I'm a liberal, I go anywhere. <laughs> so the next morning, it's Shabbat. I take my car from the Copacabana Palace Hotel where I'm staying, and I drive myself off to show. And this is what I see, which I had never seen before. This is the steps that we take before the holy prayer, Ashmonesra, it's called the 18 blessings for those who don't know. In Israel, I didn't know what it was. 
but really, it's a Jewish cha cha cha, you know. <laughs> anyway, so I see her doing this thing, and I am so impressed because it's it's real, and she's praying with such fervor and devotion, and I can't get over her. So again, I start bombarding. I said, but tell me, but tell me, but how come? But I said, listen, I gotta see you again. I gotta see you again. She says, okay. How about we go out tomorrow? I said, all right. So she comes to my hotel in a car. I said, they let you drive? <laughs> <laughs> They're not afraid you're gonna run away? <laughs> all the stereotypes that we have in our heads. All right, so what does she do? She takes me for a ride, and she takes me to the botanical garden in Rio. Anybody been to Rio? Mm -hmm. I promise you, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. Right. Oh, he falou português muito errado. Anyway, so I arrive there and um, I continue questioning her and asking her, and I'm just going like this. You know, our religion is really a racist religion. And what is this with the chosen people business? And what about the rest of the world? They're not chosen. And again, bombarding, bombarding. I said it's 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 prejudiced. It's discriminatory. And she's answering. Suddenly I said, oh my God. You see, the reason I came to America was partly the gold and money business, but the real reason was I was a graduate of Hebrew University and I have a degree in political science. I even worked for the foreign ministry. And I came to America during Watergate. I was totally enamored with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I used to walk around with the Constitution in one pocket and the Bill of Rights in the other. And I came here in 1972, the middle of Watergate, and I was witnessing the survival of a democracy because of its laws. And so this was my raison d'etre, my constitution. As I'm bombarding her with all these questions, I said to myself, oh my God, I am being impressed with the constitution and our constitution, our Torah, of which I know nothing about. I, I speak seven languages. I dabble in them. I've been all over the world. I've even learned the Bahatavad Gita in Sanskrit. But about my Judaism, I know nothing. Nothing. I said, oh my God, you really exist. There's a purpose to life. There's a mission for each one of us. And I have to find out how I fit in. And because you have shown me this, without heartache, without sorrow, without tragedy, illness, I'm going to give up for you the five things that I hold most dear. And each year it gets harder to say them. 